I'm Jill Baldoff, Associate Dean, Alumni Relations. And our goal today is to establish a safe forum to evaluate our biases, understand systemic racism, question underlying assumptions and principles, ask those questions that so desperately need answers, and importantly, find resources and actions we can utilize to move the agenda forward and eradicate inequality and racism. Our format today will be a discussion by three panelists representing the faculty, staff, and alumni of Anderson, moderated by Jonathan Schrader, class of 2000, our alumni president. They'll speak for approximately 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to your questions. You're encouraged to ask your questions using the Q&A feature of Zoom. We'll follow up today's session with an email with various resources to expand conversations, articles, podcasts, websites, books, as well as organizations in need of support for societal change. And finally, here's the bottom line. We don't know exactly what to expect today. It may get a little bit uncomfortable. It may even get a little bit messy, but we have to put a stake in the ground and start somewhere. So we'd rather begin the dialogue, no matter how messy, than leave things as they are, because we know exactly where that gets us. So with that, let me introduce Jonathan Schrader, 2000, our moderator and president of the UCLA Anderson Alumni Network, Heather Caruso, Assistant Dean Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Alex Lawrence, 99, Assistant Dean MBA Admissions, and Veronica Perry St. Cyr, 2017, co-president of BBSA during her student years and now a consultant at Cap Gemini. Jonathan. Thank you, Jill. Ladies and gentlemen of the Anderson Alumni Network, we have an hour here today, and I'm gonna take three minutes of it, if I might, to clarify my intent for being here. Anderson alums, we are gathered here because we have a big problem, and it's a problem worth solving. And the reason I threw my hat in the ring to moderate this amazing panel, and thank you again to my volunteers for joining me, is to possibly model how this conversation can be productive so that we collectively might move the needle in addressing racism. What follows will be imperfect. This is uncomfortable for all of us, but the four of us are going to try to do our best. We will leave you with some resources and things that can be done, but we aren't necessarily gonna unpack those things here today. My goal is to model effective conversation, even when it's uncomfortable. And I'm telling you, I'm way out of my comfort zone today. We're MBAs, so I even found a framework for us. We'll call it the four L's. Listen, learn, love, and lead. Listen, listen means profound listening. It means you're not loading up with your thought while, other, while the other person talks. Listening means that we are truly trying to understand another point of view. You're looking at a moderate white as Martin Luther King Jr. would have called me. I cannot identify with these issues and these problems. They have not been my experiences. All of my issues in my life have been first world problems. I have to learn to listen, to learn. I don't think we can come together as a community if we don't learn together. We must create a learning community that starts with listening. There are different skin colors, different generations, different experiences, which beget different values. But in this case, we have to learn together. Love. We have to love. And what I mean by loving is that we must recognize that we are part of one human family. If we can listen and learn together, we can come together as brothers and sisters, as siblings in one human family and lead. This is where the MBA of UCLA Anderson comes in. What does it mean to lead in this context? It means that for institutions, they have to ask the question, what is our social responsibility to move the needle towards one human family? They get to define what their part in this story will be. Lead also means that you, me, we get to find our part in it. If we cannot listen, learn, and love, we will never be able to lead. Lead means that in each of our spheres of influence, the circles where we have impact, we are behaving in a way that encourages connectedness instead of division. Again, my goal in this hour is all about communication and, and emulating a effective communication. We're going to do our very best. I want to thank you for joining and appreciate Veronica, Alex, and Heather for volunteering to participate. They're going to answer some questions. But to set the tone a little further, 
I'd like for each of you to share, why'd you accept the invitation to join this particular conversation today? Heather, why don't you start? Um, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you to everybody for, for being with us and, and thank you to the Office of Alumni Relations for inviting me to participate. Um, really, I think I, like many others, have felt over the last several months, I can't even really remember when it started, um, like I've been dragging a cement truck around behind me with just the weight of what's going on. Um, and it's really hard. I have two kids and, um, and a job I care a lot about and, um, and a lot of people around me uh, are suffering. But I keep getting up every day and I keep um, doing my best and I feel like we're making progress together. And I think the things that allow me to do that are various kinds of privileges, including uh, probably most um, on the top of my head these days, an incredible community, starting with my family and then of course extending to the entire Anderson community and a really great education um, and the, the education and learning that gives me ideas for how to approach every new day. So that privilege, those two privileges, the sort of um, the support of my community that I can pay forward and um, the um, advantage of education that I can also pay for it as an, edu as an educator. Those two things I want to make as available as possible, certainly to our alums. And that's why I, I accepted the invitation. Awesome. So I, th I think all of us can relate to those. Heather, thank you very much. Alex, you're next. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks everyone for putting this together. Um, you know, when we started this conversation uh, last weekend, I was asked to join the panel. Uh, there was no doubt in my mind, um, like many of you, I belong to a number of different communities, including the Anderson Alumni Group, which is a fantastic uh, group in so many ways. Uh, it's not perfect, um, but we don't have these uh, conversations um, in big forums, these types of discussions often. I want to be part of an activity, an effort to build meaningful bridges, you know, straight talk, um, like we said earlier. Um, I know there are a number of people on this webinar who care, uh, who want to be part of the solution. And when I think back to uh, my, my Anderson friends, Anderson family, uh, I remember great advice from uh, one of the stars in our network, Nikki Urban, who, who was sitting on a panel like over 20 years ago. So dialing back the clock, um, I was sitting in the back of the classroom and then her talking about community um, and advice that when someone asks you to volunteer for the right reason, say yes. Um, uh, they ask you for a reason and uh, you know, say yes, because there, there may come a time when uh, those requests not coming your way. And then the other significant reason is that, you know, I have two children, two African-American boys. Uh, me and my wife have done well for ourselves. Uh, a couple of MBAs. Um, so there's uh, plenty of uh, intellectual firepower in our household. Um, we want their experiences to be better than our own, um, exposed in the opportunities that we may not have had growing up. Uh, but at the same time, I see, uh, similar experiences for them uh, that I personally went through uh, years ago, uh, being the only person that looked like myself uh, from the early ages in elementary school through high school and math and science and uh, English classes. And then in college, one of only eight black students in a group of 300 engineers. And, you know, many times, um, even today, I'm only the person, I'm the only person that looks like me in a room, whether it be business meetings or other activities outside of the workplace, traveling to different cities around the world. So I wanna help build a pool of young professionals who will change um, the academic and professional landscape for younger people of color uh, to take advantage of five, 10 years uh, down the line. Alex, that's great. And to have you in a position of supporting admissions at, at our MBA institution uh, allows for that perspective to really play out. And I thank you for, for that and, and bringing that to the table. Veronica, thanks for jumping in a little bit last minute on us. Why'd you say yes? Yeah, um, you know, as Heather mentioned, um, a lot has been going on in the world. And, you know, I started this week pretty feeling pretty defeated um, with what was happening. And the message from Jill was almost right on time because it woke me up and allowed me to realize that I have a voice and I have a platform. and 
rather than feeling defeated, I should continue to feel empowered and look for ways to use my voice and my platform like I did when I was a student at Anderson being president or one of the co-presidents of the Black Business Student Association to share my opinions, to share my thoughts, to share the perspective that I have as a young alumni and someone of a very um, empowered generation that has really taken a stance to push forward change so I really just wanted to, to represent both my class, my community, um, as well as my generation to be able to speak um, on issues like this and in environments like this to spread change and, and also to, to spread hope. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So my goal is to be a bit vulnerable and ask questions that if the three of us were in the room that to unpack where I can be better and look for you to provide me with information based on your experiences. And Veronica, I'll ask you my first question. With the recent deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor specifically, there have been other issues as well, but it's put racism clearly prominently back on our radars again. Were improvements made under Obama and we've now taken steps backwards or has it been in your experience just less visible and now raging to the surface again? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So, um, I mean, racism and race relations are, you know, as we know, pretty, pretty hefty topics to talk about. But in its sim most simplistic form, racism is, you know, it's not necessarily tied to a Black experience. I think that is one of the most common references of racism. But if we think about what happened during 9-11 um, and the the, um, the racism that was expressed towards um, our people in the Muslim community, those types of things were continuously happening. Um, so I do think it's a lot more visible now, of course, with social media, there's a lot more access, there's a lot more knowledge, there's a lot more frustration that's shared and people can connect over those common experiences of frustration. And it also provides a platform. It provides a platform for both people of color or people that have experienced racism to share their stories. And it provides that same platform for, for people to comment and for people to, to share hate and for people to, to videotape hate and for it to be a lot more accessible to everyone um, across the world. Um, to your point, you know, when we think about the election and the time that, that President Obama spent in office, it was definitely a landmark moment, right? Not just for, for Black Americans, but just in American politics, right? It was deep, it was symbolic, it was important. It was something that many generations and many people felt they would never see. Over the course of Obama's administration, the quality of Black lives definitely improved, right? High school graduation improved, life expectancy improved with some of the healthcare reforms that were generated as part of that. Um, but at the same time, there was an increase in hate crime and hate speak. When you see a, when a group of people see a different race have be in a position of power and they may feel that either it was undeserving or that their own race is superior, I feel that the President Obama and his experience and his election and all the time leading up to the election actually heightened the visible racism that many Black Americans had continuously felt for centuries on end. Um, so, you know, racism, you know, at one point in the U.S. was legal. You know, we had American slavery where we did, we explicitly said that one race was above or superior than another. We had segregation um, where we had laws that were enacted to, to keep races apart or to keep lines of equity um, separate between blacks and whites, right? And when you think about um, what happened with President Obama, he was a president of the United States. He wasn't the president for, um, you know, for just a particular group of people. So although he made great improvements for black Americans, his focus and his agenda was to improve the overall human race, right? For, the, for those um, within the United States. So that was definitely something that, that he was focused on. But you know, when we think about segregation and we think about what's happening, segregation ended in 1954, which doesn't seem like that, you know, that long ago, right? We're in 2020, people in 19, who were born 
um, during the segregation area are still alive. They were brought up on these customs that racial segregation and racial separation and rape, racial superiority was okay. Matter of fact, it was, a, it was a law, it was ruled, it was a social custom. Um, so getting to change people's minds is, is hard. I mean, everyone is in some case resistant to change but when we think about, um, you know, what's happening now, I think that that frustration, that that platform that we see via social media has enabled um, things to be much more visible, not only to people of color, but to everyone around the world, no matter your race, no matter, no matter your origin. And I think that is the piece that has become a lot more important during this time. But racism has always existed. And it's been visible um, both in experience um, for, for people all over the world, but now it's just on a higher platform. Veronica, we got a chance, thank you. We had a chance to unpack a little bit in just prepping for this, the, the, the experience of your grandma who's still alive at 98, I think? 96, yeah, 96. so she was born in 1924. Wow. She lived 30 years in you know legal segregation, so her, own views and opinions were, you know, formative um, during the during that time. So that's definitely something that she takes with her. I'm 31. You know, if the laws change tomorrow to say we drive on the left side of the road versus the right, I'll be getting in accidents for the rest of the year. Right? It's not easy to change something that you knew as law for the majority of your lifetime and for the majority of your experiences. And when we have people that are still alive and can recall on those experiences and they pass those stories of when you know when we were allowed to do this versus this group was allowed to do that then those sentiments begin to trickle down into additional generations right so how do we continue to have to you know to understand that those experiences were real on both sides of the table but we have to continue to move forward and make those experiences, like you said, visible so that we can start to determine what's wrong versus what's right. I love the fact that you see an opportunity to have an engagement in a difficult conversation, even with your own grandmother, as it relates to understanding her experiences versus yours and, and building out that. And uh, I hope that, I mean, it sounds like you guys are pretty close and I hope that conversation can continue to happen. But thank you for sharing that. Um, just been because, because of time, I would unpack that further, but, but Alex, um, I keep hearing the word ally, white ally. What would you want your experience to be with an ally to be like? Do you need one? Unpack that for me. Yeah, sure. So I think everyone needs an ally, but uh, specifically what I would look in an ally, you know, first there has to be a willingness on the person's part to educate uh, yourself about the different identities um, uh, and experiences, uh, challenge your own discomfort and prejudices, uh, learn and practice the skills of being an ally, take action to create interpersonal uh, institutional change. You know, um, again, like I mentioned earlier, when we started this conversation earlier in the week, I appreciated you, Jonathan, kind of talking about like, hey, you don't know everything you, you're willing to learn. Uh, of course, you and I, we, we've known each other for many years, uh, but, you know, those practical sort of skills, um, and, you know, we, we talked about this earlier in the week, too. Uh, one of my, my big things for this type of discussion is to give um, the people who are on this call actionable things that they can use when they go back to sort of their own situations. And what I appreciate in an ally, and it's not necessarily always sort of directed for my own benefit, but when we're sitting in meetings, you know, let's just say like, because we spend so much time uh, during, the, uh, during the week in uh, days when we were in this virus pandemic, um, we would spend a lot of time at work. But, you know, in the sort of professional setting, you know, when you see individuals uh, who may be, uh, say, the only person, you know, maybe it's the only woman, maybe it's the only uh, underrepresented minority sitting in the meeting, and what I would appreciate or what I do appreciate uh, from allies is making sure that their voices are heard. They're not marginalized in these type of settings. Um, moments where, and this is one of my pet peeves, is when people talk over me. And you know, when you, when, when you see that happening, um, 
you know, the best thing you can do is allow, and I try to do this myself, is, you know, point those individuals out from the standpoint of, you know, you, you had a thought, do you want to continue your thought? Um, just so that, again, that they feel part, because it's hard, you know, there's, a, it's, it's very hard to sometimes come in those uh, rooms, those uh, situations where, again, you may be the only person. And again, I know a lot of sort of the focus or talk right now is um, about Blacks, African Americans, etc. And uh, the other thing that I appreciate about allies as well are those who um, are willing to show empathy, um, those who are willing to listen, um, because, you know, just like Heather brought up earlier, Veronica commented too, you know, there's a lot of things that are sort of going on in the background for individuals um, that you may not necessarily know about. So just listening is one of those key, those, those key skill sets. And, you know, don't take away the power from the individual who is, in, some, in many cases, you know, mustering up the courage to share things that they may not be comfortable with. Uh, don't take away the power of, you know, talking about your own experiences. Um, listening is just like a, like a key art um, that is necessary. Um, but then the other thing that I think is so critical, and I uh, remember hearing earlier uh, this week when uh, on, you know, different business leaders um, are talking about their own experiences. Um, you have the CEO of Merck uh, talking about his own, and it's that, that idea of opening up your network um, because there's gaps and opportunities for a lot of individuals. Um, so many don't necessarily have access to say the C-suite or other opportunities that um, may not have been available for them. So just opening up the network, making the connections. Uh, you said it yourself, you know, I'm in a position where uh, just being here affiliated with the school and admissions and things of that nature, being alumnus, I have a lot of different connections. Um, I made through the alumni network as well as I sort of connected current students just because of my own personal uh, sort of uh, contacts. But those are the things that, you know, and, and there's a lot more, but those are the things I would look in an ally. And, you know, I would also just sort of, when I think about the allies that for me are there, uh, you know, talking specifically with the Anderson Alumni Network, it's easy for me where names just roll off my tongue. Clayton Freck, Marta Farah, you know, Henry Brandon, um, Audrey Yamamoto, a lot of these individuals sort of circle around uh, the years that I graduated, but those are individuals who aren't just necessarily, you know, reaching out after many years of not even talking. Um, they're constantly just sort of like checking on the well-being of each one of us, see how things are going. Um, because again, those are sort of the allies that know whether it be in the professional setting or in our own personal lives, those things matter. Alex, I appreciate that. And the key piece, two things I heard here is educate yourself. And by doing that, it's not just reading and resources, and we'll try to provide that for, and I've seen a ton on the listserv as well. But I think my favorite was the expanding your, your network, your sphere, because we've heard the term echo chamber. We're really good at these big words that to mean something, but the echo chamber that we find ourselves in to branch away from the echo chamber, chamber by expanding your sphere, sounds like it would be a valuable way to just get more information so you've got more clarity about the challenges that are there. Um, and uh, the listening with empathy, I'm trying to do that here. It's not that easy to do in a moderating forum online, but um, that's really what I think it's about the most. Start there so that you can begin to learn. And so thanks for highlighting those uh, for us today. Um, as a 51-year-old white male raised in the West Valley of Los Angeles, I'm probably the poster child for white privilege. Heather, any of you, you haven't spoken yet, but any of you could take this. Can you frame what white privilege is, through, through, not through opinion per se, but just through your experiences? I mean, the first thing I'll say, I, this is a really big, um, a big topic. Uh, I'll say my own personal experience with white, I, I grew up in a town um, just about two hours north of here that was majority white. Um, and most of my observations, which then have become now a subject of research of white privilege have to do with things that um, white people don't have to deal with on a regular basis, don't have to think about on a regular basis. Um, it's not about an intentional disregard of issues. It's about just being free of various kinds of concerns because of securities that come with the historical um, sort of positions in which white people have, um, have, have just been. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I started off talking about the sort of cement truck of feelings that I feel like I'm, I'm bringing around with me. And a big part of what makes that so heavy are thoughts and feelings about the recent police killings, the ones that came before that, the stress and distress that's being uh, experienced by members of the Black community now, um, and the, the um, distress that was less visible um, and that had to be um, sort of addressed in more local communities before because no one beyond those local kind of African-American communities uh, noticed. Um, it's, it's knowing that and, and having um, had to carry that around for a really long time and to be in those communities and to kind of in some ways go across the border into other communities because I've spent my life in a lot of different institutions that have been majority white and so there are times when I'm definitely in rooms um, with a lot of people who are I think less likely to be carrying around uh, those feelings and I'm definitely not carrying around some of the feelings um, that people of uh, different marginalized communities are and um, and obviously, I'm not a majority group member um, in, the, in terms of race and ethnicity, so I don't know what that's like either. Um, so I, I think it's important to understand that privilege is something we all have by virtue of what we um, we sort of don't know yet and haven't had to know and haven't had to attend to about what other people are going through. And because um, various kinds of security really ramp that up, people in majority group, um, high status, sort of high societal status positions. Um, are going to be particularly likely to have that kind of disproportionate privilege relative to marginalized communities. So that's kind of how I think about it. The thing is that you don't have to attend to, um, whereas, for example, marginalized communities can't completely ignore what's going on for white people in America because they control so many things. Um, so there has to be some attention to and some, some empathy for the white experience. That doesn't mean that everything is understood. It just means you, you just really can't get by without understanding something about what white people are going through. That's not the same in the other direction. That's how I'd start thinking about it. So to that end, and Alex, you talked about, you know, individuals being marginalized in meetings and, and sort of that's sort of a small version of perhaps where white privilege reveals itself unconsciously, subconsciously, et cetera. As we try to become more woke, I guess, as the kids say, remember I'm 51, but what, how can I be more attuned to those moments when privilege, so, so that I'm at least aware of it? I don't know necessarily how to address it and I've got to work through that, but I can at least be more aware of where my privilege is having an impact. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so hopefully, I, you know, I, I believe I understand the, your question. And like, you know, I think one of the big things is really being aware of the optics you know, and it's, you know, to Heather's point and even sort of the previous you know, question that was asked, you know, you got to be like aware of the, your surroundings. The optics are so key. Um, I, I just, you know, taking for as long as I've been here at Anderson and just even my personal experiences, you know, those sort of like uh, to Heather's point, like when you are sort of in, um, in, in situations, environments um, where they are sort of very, whether they're very comfortable for you or the images really reflect you or they don't resonate with you, then that's where some of, like I said, the, that being uncomfortable can come from. Um, you know, the, for some people, you know, I'm sure, you know, we talked about this before, people, um, some instances have to put on masks they have to put on these images. They have to put on this air of being uh, perfect um, many times uh, for fear or just thinking that there is sort of uh, not an opportunity to make mistakes. So I think, you know, going back to your initial part of your question, you know, talking about how can you uh, help, how can you be more aware? Um, I, I go back to that part about, you know, the education part, I think it's having the discussion, the dialogue, so that you can ask those questions, uh, feel comfortable. Um, I bounced around all over the country growing up in Jersey, living in the South, Minnesota, et cetera. And what I have appreciated in many of those instances is when people have asked uh, those questions to educate themselves. Uh, because then for me, I did get a, a good sense of where they were, what was their thinking on such sort of important uh, matters. 
um, versus those, those who may say stay silent um, and not really knowing how they do feel. Uh, not that you need to go up to each person and ask them how do they feel in every subject matter. Um, there is that uh, level of sens uh, sensitivity that you have to be mindful of. But I think that dialogue, um, that courage, that honesty is so important. That, that's helpful. I, the the self-awareness piece for all of us. And I think, you know, there's a term, but I think it's in the brain, the reticular activator system. I'm winging it at this point, but I've heard the term before. And it's what gets activated in your brain when you're shopping for a car. And suddenly it looks like everybody on the road is driving the same car and you see the car all the time. It's always been there. You just see it because it's top of mind. My hope is that these experiences and these conversations bring these experiences more top of mind for me so that it allows me to be more aware to your point, the, 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 to be present in the room and be able to see it. Um, I wouldn't have been before this because it just wasn't top of mind. But the fact that this discussion is happening, I hope, helps elevate that and, and allows me to be more active. Um, I, I've heard reference to a, a term, the talk, which is a, a coming of age conversation that I understand that black families have had and, and, and continue to have with each other. I, I'm assuming some of you, all of you are familiar with the term. Does anyone wanna share that a story, that story with us today? Sure, I mean, I'll kick it off. I, I brought it up earlier, um, so now that my uh, my oldest 13 years old he's again going into a, a larger environment he's been sort of when i say a large environment in middle school um he's been exposed to different experiences that he's come home and answering asking those questions and anywhere from like friends that don't look like him for the longest you know for, uh, for the longest of time those uh, relationships all of a sudden start uh using phrases words the n-word uh, not necessarily directed at him, um, but feeling comfortable with using such a that such that language and not necessarily recognizing uh, who he is, um, his uh, feelings. So we have always had those discussions uh, when instances like this does come up, like the protest. Why are they protesting? Because we we know that you know in normal times when they go back into the classroom um, at their schools. Uh, again, they're not necessarily the majority. Uh, we don't necessarily know what all the experiences that they may have throughout the day, uh, but we don't want them to sort of be always wondering what is going on around us. Um, so, uh, and I even sort of dial it back way back, you know, again, kind of starting to show my age, right? Uh, I remember being in elementary school and the teachers of color would have those discussions with some of the students. They would pull us to the side and just having that discussion, asking us questions, being a little bit more attentive to that. Uh, that may not necessarily happen at the schools as much as we may want uh, many times today. Uh, but again, you know, when you see these things play out, sometimes in the movies, you're watching this and some may say, uh, you know, does this really happen? Um, you know, for, for many of us, like we're not surprised. Um, I, I wanna give uh, sort of big credit to Veronica I remember when there was a diversity theater uh, event on campus when she was a student she facilitated uh, during Black History Month. It was great to see 60 students in the classroom um, who were just as uh, curious about what is the Black experience. And when I was sitting in the back and looking around, uh, I saw other students in many cases crying um, just trying to understand what was going on, just not even knowing that that is what sort of our students of color had to go through on a daily basis. But, you know, just to wrap it up, just tying back to that, like, yes, we, we still have those conversations because, again, not being at home with them every day, you know, outside of what's going on today is so important because we want to make sure that they're safe and at the same time encourage them to ask questions. Thank you for sharing that, Alex. I, I feel like I could go down a rabbit hole with that one further, just unpacking the choices of sending your children to a school where they are in the minority versus maybe a school where there's more like them. And so does that help or hurt? Uh, and trying to unpack that story. I, um, was there anything that did, if, if you can do it quickly, is there anything that would play in your decision about sending them to the school where that was something that was prevalent or were there just no other options? So, you know, it, again, like I mentioned, we're fortunate. We do have choices, 
right? So we can go private schools, we can go public schools. Um, some of the things that, you know, weigh on my mind, and it's interesting, you know, talking uh, with other classmates, sort of like, you know, do you want the, your kids to have sort of that grit, that same experiences as you do, versus like sending them to a school that maybe some of those challenges may not necessarily be as pre prevalent. It is, it was a struggle. It continues to be because we just have like, you know, where, where do we want them to go, say, for a high school or something of that nature, even college, if that's an option. So I don't have a clear answer for you on that one, but it is definitely not an easy one. It's not definitely solved. We don't have a clear solution right now, but we do have at least ideas of where we want to go. Yeah, and Jonathan, if Thank I you, if I may jump in, please. Um, you know, for for undergrad, I went to Spelman College, which is a historically black you know university, um, and I made the decision to to go to that to that university. That was something that I wanted to be a part of, and you know, although. I, I um, you know, we didn't have the talk. What we did learn about um, was African and African American history and traditions. You know, the difference um, and the intersectionalities between what happened um, on the African continent and what happened here in the United States. We learned about the African diaspora and having, you know, a formal and structured education on the history of, of race and the history of the African continent um, and racism and the, you know, the development of Atlanta, um, a city that is rooted in the civil rights movement and how that has played across the globe and particularly across the United States was very helpful and very formative to me as a black woman um, comparatively to, to Heather's experience growing up in Atlanta. Um, I, I had my own privileges of being in the majority um, for you know a good part of of my of my formative years because um, Atlanta is a city where um, like I said with the civil rights movement there there are a lot of successful um, black and African American um, people um, businessmen entrepreneurs um, you name it here and that was very helpful and formative to to me and how I developed and making a choice um, to get my education my my bachelor's degree at Spelman College was, was very helpful. And I even think it made me um, a better student at UCLA. There were you know, scenarios that I felt more comfortable to address head on, such as the event that Alex had talked about because all of the women that came to attend Spelman, although they were mostly all black, um, they all had a very different experience. They had different perspectives um, there. You know, and for some of them, it was the first time ever that they had been in an all black environment. So I had a chance to learn from, from my classmates and bring some of, those, um, some of those differences and the variants that I saw across black women period, um, but across the black community to Anderson and figure out how I can use my platform um, as the co-president of the Black Business Student Association to one, be more inclusive to that, which is why uh, we changed the Black Business Student Association versus African American Students and Management um, during the time when I was uh, the lead, but also to have those, those conversations to share that there's not one Black experience. Um, and although, you know, you may group um, or, or feel like your, your classmates of color have a similar experience, it was very helpful and I think informative to, to our classmates to see how varied um, the experiences were just from a small group of, of students. Yeah, I, I could jump in um, on that. And, and Jonathan, I know we're, we're sensitive to time, so, um, so let me know. But I, so my, the, the talks I have with my children are pretty different from um, what I think you were referencing, Jonathan, because um, my husband is white. My children present as sort of may, maybe white-ish sometimes, but then if they get, no joke, I'm not joking, if they get a tan, they present very differently. Um, and that's just a reality of how, of how it works. And, um, and that makes um, the identity conversation with them really hard. Um, and I am half black and half Asian and my black side, my dad is Nigerian from Nigeria. Um, and so has a, a distinct identity from what a lot of people are referring to when they say African-American and he's had to live with that. And I've had to live with his living with that. And it's just, it gets really complicated. And I've talked to uh, a number of people over the course of my life, both professionally and personally, about how 
I love the learning that people want to do in this space. I love that people are are um, are excited about you know what they can read and what they can watch and how they can ask um, for stories because those stories are important. But I want to be clear: we have limited lifetimes, and there is no way we will all preload all of the information. Like we're all going to go read all the books and watch all the movies, and then like and then go talk to people, and we'll be totally prepared and know all the stuff in advance. Right? There's there's just no version of that. And so for me, this has given me a significant focus on the development of the skill of learning who the person in front of you is and not needing to know before you come to them, but when you come to them, discovering who they are in that moment. Because ultimately what I, what I appreciate most, because nobody knows what, no one's gotten a handbook on what it's like to be a Nigerian Vietnamese American woman like that's not ever going to happen no one's going to come to me and have a good sense of that cultural background so the thing that succeeds the most is when someone comes to me and just gets to know me with with as um, sort of little preconceived notion as possible they can make guesses and they can say you know they can tell me where they think they are they can try to be considerate but I think what's really important is a step that's often missed which is like just check did that work? Like, was that, am I right about this thing that I just tried to accommodate for you? Is this actually where, what we should be doing or how I should ask or how I should identify you? It's like, it's not, it's not actually that hard. And it's incredibly um, uh, rewarding to know that the other person on the side of um, the, con the conversation with me is willing to make me the author of my identity and make me the author of my experience so that, you know, they can get, kind of get the, get the dialogue started, but they want to make sure I approve of, um, of the impression that's being uh, made. And, and the dignity that that gives, I think every person in the conversation is- Heather, I, I, I know you have a format and I've seen it, the echo, which if we had more time, I would ask you to unpack. So maybe we'll include it in um, the communications we share afterwards, but it's a format. It's a, it's a way for people to try to engage in conversation. It's what I've tried to do here. I, I hope that I've tried to emulate some element of echo or at least some active listening for all of you uh, in trying to move the, this conversation forward. Um, we're gonna try to jump to quickly to Q&A and I see the Q&A is blowing up um, with 20 minutes left. Uh, I just wanna thank you all for participating and we won't be able to get through all of them but that means there's activity in this group and we're appreciative of it. I suggest that if we happen to miss your question I ask that you take your questions back to your sphere of influence and see if you can get them answered there and try to practice what we've tried to share and, and experience here today. Um, I do wanna start with, um, we've been joined by Tony Bernardo, uh, who, uh, Dean Bernardo, who will be addressing uh, very quickly the um, issue that arose with a professor uh, and in some communi communication with um, some black undergraduate students. Tony, thanks for joining us. Uh, your update would be grateful, thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Jonathan. Thank you also the panelists um, and all of you are, are joining today. I learned a lot. Um, I'm also learning. I need to uh, learn a lot more, but I really appreciate uh, this time together. As Jonathan mentioned, you probably are aware uh, we had um, a, a very troubling um, uh, situation that we learned about on Tuesday of a, a lecturer uh, at Anderson who, who wrote two uh, really highly uh, inappropriate, um, really actually frankly outrageous uh, emails. Uh, not only did they not show empathy for um, the very challenging times all our students are facing, but particularly our black students are facing, it was uh, really um, uh, callous and uh, I don't think uh, there's any way it could be excused. Uh, we learned about it on uh, Tuesday and uh, we, we, we really uh, move, uh, we moved quickly. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our, our students had a safe, uh, um, you know, it's very, it was very important that the students have a, a, a safe environment to continue uh, learning. Uh, they were still in the midst of their spring quarter. So um, subsequent to this, uh, Professor Klein uh, was put on leave and his uh, classes were reassigned to other instructors and, uh, currently uh, the, the conduct is under review and is being investigated and we will learn more as the in the in the days and weeks ahead but at the present moment he uh, he is on uh, he's on leave from campus and his courses have been reassigned and all of the co uh, conduct of the courses will be 
managed by uh, two other instructors. Uh, this was uh, extraordinarily painful to everyone in our community. Uh, we, re we received uh, hundreds and hundreds of emails in response. Um, uh, both uh, Heather and I uh, in, uh, in particular received uh, a lot of emails. This is a very, I, I would say one of the um, really low points of my 26 years at Anderson, uh, uh, especially coming from a long standing faculty member, uh, uh, kinds of behaviors that are completely unacceptable, completely unacceptable and go against our core principles. I think that also suggests that we have to do things going forward that uh, including training our faculty, training our broader community about appropriate uh, norms and standards of conduct. Uh, you know, Heather and I have had a lot of discussions about this over the year, but this, uh, 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 this suggests, uh, you know, we, we need to move uh, as quickly as possible to remedy uh, whatever issues we have like this in our community. Dean, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate you leaning in and um, demonstrating leadership by leaning into this conversation and engaging the community to, to make it better. So, so thank you. Um, stick around. We might have a couple in the Q&A that might pop up that are relevant to you. So if you don't mind. Um, I have, uh, there was one that in particular, um, as I go through the Q&A, I just lost it. Oh, um, this is a good one. Uh, 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 they're all good, but this one caught my attention. As Americans, we are steeped in the idea that we are free. What does that mean? And how do each of you experience, uh, what does that mean to you personally? And what do you think it would be like to be denied uh, that freedom? Or I, I guess if I were to reframe it, is it, it, America is the land of the free, home of the brave, and yet do you, do you feel that sense of freedom, and how, how does that how has that experience been for you? Um, to anybody? <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, go ahead, Alex. Go ahead. Alex, go ahead. Yeah. Um, again, that's a big question, right? How do I feel? Do I feel free? I don't think I feel free that I can just do anything. Um, uh, I, and again, I think it's very it's a very individual sort of um, for the individual to sort of answer. Uh, me personally. I have the mindset that um, I feel or I think I can take advantage of any opportunity, right? I don't necessarily know sort of all the, say, the backdrops, whether uh, what those may be, but I'm going to always do my best. Not everybody um, sort of has maybe that same mindset or has that ability. Um, today, I feel somewhat free, but at the same time, I'll tell you, I'll be cautious. Um, there's certain areas that I don't go to. Um, there's certain areas... Uh, that I'm mindful, like I said, of the optics, um, just because of like my awareness and my previous experiences that, you know, I'm not going to like bring all of those up from my own um, experiences when I was much younger. But based off of those experiences when I was much younger, I'm more cautious about the, my experiences going forward, if that makes sense. Heather? Heather, Veronica? Um, it, it's interesting. I was just having um, a good conversation with people about this and um, the, the thought that that brought to mind is that in the discussion we had, I realized, yeah, I feel, um, I feel some freedom, some autonomy that comes with the privileges I talked about before, obviously being um, uh, a member of a supportive family, supportive community um, that mobilizes you and releases you. Um, it, there's a sort of trust that comes with that that allows you to do a lot of things. I feel that freedom. Um, education is incredibly um, freeing, which is why I'm so proud to work for a, a school that has such a strong public mission um, to try to increase the, uh, the extent to which education can, can be similarly freeing for other people. Um, I, I will also say what I realized is that I don't want to be entirely free. I actually don't want to live in a world where I can do whatever I want and, and no one cares because it, in some ways it means that no one cares, right? So like the constraints of a caring community when we say, look, this is a line, you don't cross it. Um, is, that's important, which is why the kinds of actions Tony alluded to earlier, the kinds of things that we're talking about um, in terms of you know, what, what we owe one another um, because we are members of the same community, the kind of empathy and understanding that we owe one another. I, I like that there are boundaries there um, and that I, I, I kind of want to keep those and to feel um, like that's a condition under which I get to enjoy uh, the privileges of being a member of the community. Thank you. Um, 
interesting question as well. Um, in the event you hear insensitive, uh, I as the white privilege, moderate white individual at work, uh, someone else asked me how I plan to use the, my position, uh, which is incredibly fortunate in, in its own way. Uh, and I recognize it, but how can I now use my position and support and be an ally and, and then sort of tailor to that in the event I see, um, uh, how'd they ask it? Uh, how to address racially insensitive comments at work, particularly with more senior colleagues. Uh, there's, there is the straight call out. I, mean, I was on another panel that suggested that um, there's no respect. They, you know, do it with respect. And there's, why should I respect the racially insensitive comment? That, that's, they weren't respectful. Why should I respectful back? Um, thoughts on that? It, it, is it something that you stand up and fight for? Or is there a better way to respond that lands better? Have you had experience? What, what can I do better? And Jonathan, to just so I'm understanding, what can you as a as a non-person of color do better to combat that? Correct. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that this is this goes to the conversation that we had about it's not about not being a racist. It's about being anti-racist. It's about taking active steps to combat racism. And it's not just racism in the sense that I think that my race is better than yours, right? It's prejudice, it's bias, it's stereotyping, it's racial profiling, right? It's, it's subtle, it, it can be subtle. It can be a comment about a hairstyle. It can be an inability or an unwant to pronounce a name on a resume, right? I think we saw a lot of people, you know, not able to pronounce, you know, oh, this black sounding name or that name sounds black but we have major television shows, right? Daenerys Targaryen, people, you know, love it or hate it. We can pronounce it, we can spell it. It's not a challenge. It doesn't seem like something that's too hard to do, right? So how can you actively think about, you know, how you use terms of, of race and how you can be anti-racist, how you cannot use, you know, negative scenarios of black. When you say things are black and white, are you saying things are wrong and white, wrong and right? You know, or is that how you're positioning things? You know, when you see um, it can be talking about, you know, assessing how people are promoted in your organization or looking at equity, um, you know, across pay or looking at, um, you know, just general stereotyping. You know, are you shocked if I tell you that I golf on the weekends? Why? They're women golfers. Tiger Woods is a person of color and is an amazing golfer. But if your initial re reaction was to be shocked or surprised or to feel the tingle down your spine, how can you assess what that means for you and why it was unexpected? Was it because of my race? Was it because of, you know, the way that you may have perceived me? So how do you think about actively combating feelings and addressing feelings and being you know, vulnerable and uncomfortable um, to respond to things like that. Um, not necessarily negatively or, or positively or making a, a big stand. I think the first piece is acknowledgement. Um, a lot of people um, look to, to not acknowledge, you know, anything that's happening. So the first piece is acknowledging, um, understanding that um, empathy is, is a huge component of, of acknowledgement and understanding and then looking for ways to, to self-reflect so that it doesn't happen again so you can continue to share your experience and to be shared um, to share your experience with others. Yeah, I, I think the empathy comment's key. It's about listening and recognizing that everyone's got a different experience, a different story, a different lens through which they view the world and to give them the opportunity to share that story before we leap to some judgment. And it goes in both directions. Um, there's been some lively chatter on the email listservs um, and there have been folks that have stepped a little bit over the line, but they have a story and that, you know, it goes to the idea of respect. Um, it does us no good to jump on them. They have a story. The idea is, my thought is it requires some listening as well and it goes both ways. We can unpack this and I'd love to do this more. There are two school related questions. And as long as we're uh, grateful to have Dean Bernardo here, it may be something you have to host another town hall for Tony, but uh, in the time, the two questions and having Alex here is helpful too. Um, just talk about the diversity effort in terms of how we engage incoming students, if you don't mind, uh, in an effort to support that diversity and, and, and uh, how the school supports that. And then the second question, uh, Dean is, um, there was some conversation about um, Jackie Robinson Stadium being used for um, after the protests. Um, if you can just unpack what you're aware of, if anything, 
about that circumstance. It sounds like the community could use some answers there. But Alex, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. So I'll limit it to two, I think, very important things. So um, I want to commend um, our senior leadership this year in particular because we did commit additional resources. We changed uh, some of the practices in recruiting for our class of 2022. While I'm cautious about reporting on the specific numbers, um, because it's a long way between now when the students will enroll and start on campus in September, is that think there will be an increase in the number of African-American students. There will be an increase in the number of women. I'm going out on a limb and saying that our percentages have been low throughout the years, um, but this year we're gonna make some leaps and bounds that we haven't seen in quite some time. Um, the second thing that I would say, you know, in terms of supporting the students, today literally is the first day of the consortium orientation program. And from those who don't know, it's, a, it's an organization that we partnered with uh, years ago. It's uh, 54 years um, old, so to speak, the consortium. Um, and it's a, a fantastic opportunity for underrepresented uh, minority students um, looking at getting a graduate management degree, uh, a vast majority being full-time MBA. Uh, we have a larger consortium class this year. Um, it's not the highest, but we are in the top three of all the partner schools, close to 20 partner schools. Um, I think those are big steps in the right direction. And again, I commend uh, Dean Bernardo, um, Weiler, and that Heather's here as well. We're making the right moves in my, in my uh, own opinion. And again, I've been affiliated with the school for 25 years and these are the type of moves that we need to do and consistently do next year and the following year. Tony? Thank, thanks for the leadership there. It, it's, it's great. Dean? Yeah, thanks. I, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Heather, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, but um, um, just to I, I can just say a few um, things. I can just say a few uh, things and then maybe you- uh, Additional oh. plans. Oh, I seem to <laughs> No, sorry. Yeah, Heather, give your, give, your, give your comment. Okay. Um, uh, that we have solidified additional plans to engage. Oh. You went mute. Okay. There you are. We have made additional plans uh, to um, to engage current students in helping us to ensure that uh, the students who are coming on board um, from the consortium and um, and other marginalized communities are especially. Uh, well supported in the transition uh, to uh, to starting their programs in the fall. So I'm really excited about that. It's a really wonderful uh, community driven uh, effort that we're going to be able to launch. Glad we and, and I'll just say briefly to add to that. Um, uh, we, many of you have heard me talk about a strategic planning committee that was formed. Um, it, this committee uh, will uh, reach out to our broader stakeholders uh, in a variety of ways, but one of the, the key charges of the committee is around improving the quality of our work and learning involve, uh, environment, uh, improving the climate, uh, uh, in, and improving, uh, I think, as uh, Alex has said, uh, you know, uh, a record that we need to improve upon in, in terms of the, uh, the diversity and representation of our, of our class. So this is going to be a key strategic priority for us and uh, the, the committee has been underway for now about a month, but we expect they'll be doing their work over the coming uh, roughly four to five months and you'll be hearing from them. Thank you. Oh, oh sorry, on the, on the issue of Jackie Robbins State, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot to uh, uh, address that. Uh, many of you probably saw the chancellor's email uh, from two nights ago. Uh, I, I, I imagine you know, many of you know the story of, of, of uh, how Jackie Robinson Stadium was being used by LAPD uh, really as, as UCLA put it as a field jail. It's hard to think of anything more offensive than uh, uh, using Jackie Robinson Stadium, an iconic, uh, perhaps the greatest Bruin we've ever had, uh, and, and using uh, his stadium to detain uh, uh, protesters uh, who are protesting racial injustice. The, obviously, uh, it's hard to think of something um, that goes against our core principles. And if you read the email, uh, uh, what the chancellor explained is, is that uh, they were unaware that the LAPD was using it for, for that purpose. 
They were informed that LAP, they informed the LAPD that it could not be used and it wouldn't be used in the future for this. And uh, this is all I know definitively from, uh, and, and you probably saw that email, but um, obviously um, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, really, uh, uh, really incredibly uh, insensitive, unfortunate uh, uh, circumstance given the importance of Jackie Robinson, not just to UCLA, but really throughout the nation. Thank you, Dean. Well, I hope we've achieved our goal in modeling effective communication for you today. Perhaps it would be pretty cool to have a follow-up meeting that others have a chance with different experience to share their stories as well. There's been a lot of chatter on the LA chapter email list about Black Lives Matter, some supportive and some annoyed. Maybe the annoyed folks are willing to be vulnerable and share their experiences with us. That's how the listening continues. Um, Jill, you may have information or maybe we'll share elsewhere uh, the Slack channel that has been developed. Uh, yeah, Jonathan, um, we have. In fact, we've put it on the, uh, the chat so you can find the Slack channel is posted on the chat. We'd love to have you join us there. We've also included emails for myself and Andrea Wade, so you can reach out with further ideas. I really wanna thank the panel, Heather, Alex, Tony, Veronica, Jonathan. You guys were fabulous. You hit it out of the ballpark, your honesty, your thoughtfulness, your personal experience. Um, the, the, the chat was blowing up with really wonderful comments and I, I wish we could have gotten to all the Q&A. But as I mentioned, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning of the conversation. And we're going to follow up with resources for you to personally continue your education and achieve better understanding of the issues. In addition, we're soliciting your thoughts and ideas for speakers, for topics, for formats, so we can further this discussion. So please respond directly to me or to Andrea or to the email that you'll get on Monday. Um, we cannot continue with business as usual we must continue to do the difficult work. So thank you for joining us and we look forward to many, many more discussions. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.